And that's what I think character brings to a position like this or any leadership position is this understanding that when you're leading a large group of people, i.e. the United States of America, that you have to you have to believe in people. You have to you have to think the best of people. You have to see the best in people. You have to want the best for people. And if you don't have an experience that gives you that a reason to do that, it's going to be hard for you to lead those people. Hi, everybody. Welcome to Good Guys Getting Better. I'm John Borden. I'm Aline Boatwright. And I'm Christian Hanley. All right, gentlemen, it's been a couple of weeks since we last met and talked. A lot has happened in the last couple of weeks, so we're going to do our best to succinctly and thoughtfully cover a wide range of topics, including updates uh, on the race uh, for president of the United States of America. The Olympics just ended yesterday as of the time of this recording. And then we've got some thoughts about parenting and misinformation. So, gentlemen, let's just start from the top. Let's do a recap since the last pod. Christian, what is your main takeaway from the last couple of weeks in presidential politics and or the state of the world? I mean, there's hope again. That's that's kind of the nice thing. There's, uh, you know, I think. Tim Walz, the new uh, VP nominee on the Democratic side, put it best uh, when he spoke from Philadelphia last week that when he thanked Kamala Harris for bringing the joy back. I mean, before that, we had pretty scary poll numbers, right? Like even in, in key swing states, they were starting to trend towards Trump, not because Trump had done anything in the race to inspire <laughs> any kind of confidence or uplift anybody. But just the simple fact was, you know, President Biden had that showing in the in the debate. Um, There was not much enthusiasm. And there's this whole ongoing debate about whether or not, you know, Biden could or should even drop out. But I mean, I I was always of the opinion that it was playing fantasy politics to imagine he could stay in for the long haul, not the other way around. Uh, And we've seen since he dropped out and put country over ambition and and, you know, paved the way for Kamala Harris, that there is joy, there's enthusiasm back. And now, like, it look, it's still too early. It it feels like there has been an entire year since, like, mid-July. We're recording this, like, the, the, what is it now? Second full week of August? Um, You know, but so much has just happened, and it's hard to forget that, like, this is all moving so incredibly fast. Like, Kamala Harris is not, like, the clear frontrunner right now, right? But, like, we were trending so far in the wrong direction, slowly but surely, that now all these polls coming out from the key swing states, it's showing that we're back within the margin of error, which by comparison feels like a win, right? So like that's, to me, that's the big takeaway. There's enthusiasm, there's hope. Whether you're talking the uh, uh, swing state polling being within the margin of error or just the absurd amount of cash that Kamala Harris has raised in the past couple of weeks. I mean, look, I'm never the glasses half full guy. I'm never the starry eyed optimist, but this, this feels good. It feels better than where we were at a month ago. Liam, do you share that same enthusiasm? I mean, there are a lot of data points that suggest that things are moving in the direction that the three of us on this pod would like. Aleem, you have the most popular takes on this pod. What are your thoughts on <laughs> on what what has transpired since the last pod? The most brutal takes, maybe. Uh, yeah, I don't know about the popularity point, but I I, I will say no. I, I do. I do share uh, some guarded optimism, similar to, to Christian. Um, you know, I, I, I guess what what makes it guarded is the fact that maybe my expectations would be uh, the polls completely reversing and shooting in the other direction because the <laughs> obvious nature of this candidate that Kamala Harris is, excuse me, Kamala Harris is running against, being so unqualified for the position, and it being so obvious, right? And and yeah. the fact that that's not Flipping the polls on their head is, you know, is, is like always concerning to me. But the reality is, is that you can't expect, um, uh, uh, I guess, a diametrical change that quickly to happen. So, uh, so I'm optimistic. <laughs> Christian, I know that you pay very close attention to this. Mm. If I'm, am I correct in understanding that there is typically a lag with the polls? Yeah, you know, like they are not in real time. What, what is that lag typically in the polls? And is there more cause for optimism than perhaps Salim has right now? I mean, I'm not sure I know exactly. I could say with each poll what the exact lag time would be. I'm not a pollster. Um, I just, you know, follow them like everybody else does. And I'm, I'm really much more on the media side, not on the nuts and bolts campaigning side. 
Uh, but there, that is definitely true. I mean, these things are not in real time. And look, I mean, for a lot of people who do not uh, just live and breathe politics, which is most people, thankfully, um, they're still getting to know Kamala Harris to say nothing of Tim Walls, who was not a household name, uh, you know, yesterday even. Uh, so there is going to be significant lag time. What I would say, though, the reason why I'm kind of framing it this way is I'm, I'm, I'm looking at it in relation to where we were at right before Biden dropped out of the race, right? And that was terrifying. I mean, people forget because this all moved so damn quickly. But like, we were at a point where New Hampshire was trending toward Trump, uh, <laughs> where where even Virginia was starting to to slide to the right again, like the bad old days, right? Uh, and where even I, I think Trump was going to make it, or he did perhaps make a, a stop in uh, Minnesota beforehand. And look, now I mean. Now, at this point, any of the formerly pre-2016 blue wall states are now toss-ups. They're now not lean Republican anymore. Uh, so that's Pennsylvania, that's Wisconsin, that's Michigan. Uh, and, and now Virginia and New Hampshire are not seeming to be trending towards Trump anymore. Um, I've not looked today. Obviously, it's been a, it's been a busy day for me. But um, yeah, I mean, so that that's kind of the source of my very tempered optimism is the fact that there is lag time. And I'm looking at the trends, not any, you know, one off. So right, so it's not like that's one certain poll comes in about one state, and I'm going to be like reacting to that. I'm just looking at the, the trend of these things. And it is moving away from trending Trump towards, at the very least, toss up, not if not trending Harris. Yeah. So I, that definitely, I want to pivot now to just talking about the state of the race and the polls are one of the things that we want to, to discuss. But another big data point is the fact that as of last week, uh, Associated Press reported that in the month of July, Kamala Harris had raised $310 million, <laughs> which what's impressive is that this is all post July 4th. Yeah. You know, so this is like maybe two weeks or so of, you know, we're talking $155, $155 million a week yeah. in the month of July. She didn't get the nod in uh, 2020. Um, I don't think it was particularly close. Obviously, she's our VP now. Why is there so much enthusiasm for her in an instant? Uh, well, Ali, I'll throw that to you first. I mean, why, where is it coming from? Why is everyone all of a sudden so relieved? Well, well, I, I think it's it has uh, less to do with the specificity of her candidacy than it, as it does with the fact that she is a viable option to defeat Trump by those who just don't like him. As we know, most people don't like him, right? That's that's he's, his unfavorables have always been high. Right. Uh, so the fact that you're now giving people a person to vote for who they feel like can actually defeat him, uh, I think is ginned up some enthusiasm, right? There's some, you know, and, it, and, and it's not so much, okay, what are her specific policies? They'll, they'll, they'll get to that. And, and most people hopefully will like that. But the reality is, is that they didn't believe Biden could win because of the unfavorables that he has. And she doesn't share those same unfavorables. So now, oh, well, she can win. So I think that's, that's what's driving a lot of it. That's, that seems to be what I can tell. Christian, what are your thoughts yeah. on that? I, I mean, mean the, yeah, I mean, very similar. I, it, it, and that's that's completely right. Uh, there's and this is where enthusiasm does matter, because, <clears throat> excuse me, like you, you might have had many people who would have voted for Biden just because he was not Trump. But that's not going to, that's not enough to get people to um, take cash out of their personal checking, to take mm -hmm. time out of their weekend, to go knock doors. to. It, that's not enough to get them motivated, right? Because if they see the debate performance that Biden had had before dropping out, or they even just look at coverage of Biden going into this reelection campaign, they're not going to think like, oh, well, he sure, he's going to pull this off a second time. He's going to win. And that's going to depress the motivation. That, that right there is not going to get people to actually take those extra steps of donating, volunteering, and all of that. Um, it, it is. It's, that, it's as simple as wanting to be on the side of a winning team, right? Wanting to be able to actually have a shot at winning. If people didn't feel that, yeah, they're going to vote against Trump, but they're not going to be motivated. And the other thing, too, is that I think there were some people, not I think, I know there were some people who really were thinking, well, we're probably going to lose this and mm -hmm. it's too late now because he's already locked in as the nominee. Yeah. Well, this, you know, once in, what has it been, 60 something years now? 
<laughs> uh, once in a lifetime thing happens where the sitting president does not seek reelection, mm -hmm. that changed everything. And like, let's it, again, like so much has happened in only a couple of weeks. Let's not forget that any of us who were thinking it would be strategically best for Biden to step aside and make way for either Kamala Harris or somebody else. Even just what three three and a half weeks ago, <laughs> we would have been called the crazy ones, right? <laughs> and people true. were on CNN saying this will never change. He will never leave. This is yeah, what yeah. it is. And so we're it, it's happened so fast that we now take for granted today something that was a couple of weeks ago unprecedented. Yep. yep. And so that right there, I think, explains your your shift in enthusiasm and attitude, and therefore, by virtue of that, the fundraising numbers. So let me let me take a few more. Uh, questions, follow-ups here. Um, I don't think this is happening by accident. Uh, Kamala Harris, certainly since announcing uh, Tim Walz as her VP running mate, mm -hmm. uh, has gone on a pretty intense swing, in particular in the Midwest. Yeah. Again, just scores of people coming to see her, and she is now the odds-on betting favorite to win the presidential, uh, the presidency of the United States of America, uh, bet 365. And again, I recognize these aren't pollsters, but they collect data and information that would yield the best results because they're also a business. Prior to Kamala Harris being named as, or excuse me, prior to Joe Biden dropping out, Trump was a minus 200 favorite to win. Now Kamala Harris is a minus 125 and Donald Trump is a plus 200. It would indicate to me that, to your point, Aleem, that it sounds like a pretty uh, diametric shift. Yeah, yeah. Right? Almost, it, I mean, it, it's almost perfectly symmetrical in the shift. Sure. So, one, do you think that this is all just enthusiasm, or do you think this is intentional? And as a follow-up, <clears throat> has she made any missteps in the last couple of weeks, or is it just too soon? Christian, I'll, I'll give that to you. Is, is, is she doing, is this intentional? And enthusiasm? Is it just enthusiasm that's driving this wave of popularity and fundraising? What do you think? Well, what do you mean about intentional? So, in other words, again, she's raised $310 million. Right. Right? She has done a lot of campaigning. I mean, she's, you know, kind of on this barnstorming is the headline that I'm seeing a lot. Yeah. You know, all of her critical states. Right. My question is, is that driving the enthusiasm? Is it because she's not Joe Biden? Is it because... She's just a viable candidate because, again, she wasn't four years ago. What is it about the moment? Right. Is it both circumstance or is it something she's intentionally doing to drive this enthusiasm? I mean, the short answer is yes. It, it's all the above, right? And, and it's and that's that's the thing with it's a, it's very much a lightning in a bottle kind of moment, right? Now, in in 2020, she was very much trying to calibrate and find her place in a crowded field, right? She had her track record as a prosecutor in California that alienated her from the more progressive side of the, of the Democratic Party. She was trying to figure out where her place was, and she never really found it. Now, there, there's no time for playing around with that, right? That, like, another, another thing, just to, in, in this whole conversation about how fast things are moving, right? Let's not forget that from, from Biden dropping out or discussion of Biden dropping out to him dropping out to her becoming the presumptive nominee and then having enough delegates to cinch this thing. Mm -hmm. I mean, that was a matter of days. Like this entire discussion about who the nominee should be post Biden, that conversation never even got off the ground. That's how fast this moved. And because of that compression of the timeline, there was really no time to make those sort of mistakes. It was, well, this is a general election now, right? There was no primary she had to actually win this time. It was just, all right. You know, let's do it live. Let's go. And that's what she's been doing. Uh, so to your question about if she's made any mistakes yet, like, no, and there really hasn't been any time to. Um, but we now have her raw personality in a general election setting as opposed to a primary. And the fact that she's being juxtaposed here against not only her elderly predecessor, but her elderly opponent, who now makes his former uh, opponent seem even sharper than than he is. I mean, this is the guy who has only given a public appearance three times I get, that I can count in the past week, week and a half. One was going completely insane when being held to account by a black woman on a stage in Chicago at the National Association of Black Journalists and just going crazy old white man in front Letting of everybody. 
just, yeah, just like just let it all hang out. Just like you're you're being nasty. You're not being deferential to me. All that stuff, right? Um, there was his press conference uh, at Mar-a-Lago where he's talking about how he's going to take questions from the media. And now Kamala Harris should do the same. He didn't take any questions, right? He just rambled and lied. Uh, and then there was him going to Montana, a crimson red state with, I think, three electoral votes uh, that he went to allegedly because Ronnie Jackson, the disgraced former White House pill pushing doctor and now a uh, congressman from Texas had had said something about how we need to get back at John Tester for for, you know, saying something about me on the campaign trail. So he went and gave a speech in in Montana, of all places. So, I mean, he's completely rambling and gone off the rails and she is just this breath of fresh air. So it's again, the short answer would be yes, it's all the above. It It is intentional in terms of the strategy of where she's making these speeches, where she's holding these events. Part of it is organic. It's her personality, right? Like she's not having to win in a primary contest. It's just right to the general. And she is doing great on TV, on podcasts and in live um, speeches. Uh, and, and it is just the circumstance too, right? Like people were desperate for change. Here it is. And, you know, I think a lot of it does come down to what her new running mate, Tim Walls, has said. She is a happy warrior. And so is he, but I mean, she especially is, right? She's doing this and she's fighting a lot of just disgusting, like awful people. Donald Trump, J.D. Vance, people who are overt with their racism, who are overt with their misogyny and they're really, their they're hatred of women and women's bodies. And she's out there like, yeah, they're, they're awful, but I'm not gonna let that stick to me. Let's fight them. Let's be happy about it. Let's like get out there and save our society together. And I think people are responding to that. I, I want to chime in and I want to pull on that thread too. We don't have time to cover it on this pod. JD Vance is not doing Donald Trump any favors. No. <laughs> and, 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 and like, look, you know, some of no. it is just silly, silly talk. Yeah. Uh, and we will talk about weird in a little bit. Yeah. But some of these things are beyond the pale, beyond the pale that I thought was beyond the pale with Donald Trump being both on the ticket and being the president. J.D. Vance somehow takes it to a different level. We'll leave it to our listeners and our viewers to go look up J.D. Vance's couch. Uh, J.D. Vance <laughs> okay, in but, drag. But, but can we can we pause that for a second, though? Okay, because here's the thing about this. Pause this, is the appropriate thing to say. <laughs> here's Because here's the thing. Here's the, this, this came up with Donald Trump in 2016, too. When people started asking themselves and even asking out loud on social media, like, is it okay to call him a fat slob is it okay to mock his appearance his weight he these other with jd vance it's the same sort of questions we're doing right now but like the answer is you don't need to <laughs> you don't need to go into things about did he or did he not have a sexual attraction to furniture or any of these like weird internet things and even if there's that there i think i've seen a photo or two of him allegedly in drag at a college party who cares this is a guy who made a bs book um, mocking the people that he says he grew up with, which he actually didn't. He's like halfway falsified his whole life story. He is bought and paid for by legendary weirdo and tech billionaire Peter Thiel, who is he? He's basically the you know he he is like the the artist who Peter Thiel is like his patron who's just been like paying for his entire career. And you got the example of him more recently being even more pathetic and sycophantic than than uh, Ted Cruz, mm -hmm. just fawning at the feet of Donald Trump and the you know incel virgin Nazi racist guys who all <laughs> crowd around them and support them when they attack his wife, who's Indian American. And his response is, "Yeah, I get it. She's not white, but I still love her." Like. Screw this guy. You don't need to even go to the internet rumors. Look at what he has said on live TV and just go to that. Attack that. Exactly. Who is he helping? So, so well, I, I, and I don't want to give a lot of breath to it. I mean, there are a lot yeah. of other things that we can talk about on this pod that don't, that don't have to do with anything. JD Vance. Yeah. He, right. Like yeah. the, there would be more of a concern and Aleem, I will get to you because I know you have something to say about it. I think there would be, I think it is appropriate to figure out strategically how you use that to keep someone like this from being one heartbeat away from the presidency. Like that's, yeah. that's the point. No, so, right. So go ahead, Aline. So, so it, the, the reality as Christian and you both were saying is that he's so transparently spineless and lacking in character. It's yeah. like, it's obvious, right? <laughs> you write a book like the, with the content that you just said, Christian, you write that book 
you call, you say what you say about Trump, then without any reason, no, no logical reason, you flip entirely around. It's not like you said, oh, I had some come to Jesus moment of why Trump is now such a great guy. No, I just want him to win because he, he picked me as vice president and, and I'm, uh, you know, uh, you know, seeking some type of advancement in my life. I mean, he's, 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 he has no character. And, and so, so you're right. You don't have to go to all the ridiculousness that he's exposed himself to to even talk about it. It's the same thing with Donald Trump. Just you can literally, as I've said this many times over the year, over the last few years, is that just repeat what he says. Yeah. It seems embarrassing enough. It, 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 and you, you repeat it, put a bracket around it and say, look at that. Now, a person who was president of the United States said that. How do you feel about that? <laughs> like, it, it's simple. So let, let me tap into that. You bring up a very important word, and I think that's character. And Aleem, what you said was that there was no rhyme or reason why he flip-flopped. Why is something like that important to the presidency? Well, oh, well, well I, I feel like, and, and Joe Biden is, is the perfect, and, and let me, if, if I may, in answering this question, maybe, let me go back a little bit to, to, to Kamala uh, and what, what we were saying about, about you know, the intentionality of, of how, why she's doing what she's doing, uh, seeing the success that she's seeing right now. In you know, full disclosure, I did not support her candidacy for president. I supported Joe Biden when, when she was running. Um, that's because I felt it was better, I. Better, better candidate. Mm -hmm. Now, not mm -hmm. to say if Kamala, if Kamala had gotten the, the nomination, I would have proudly and happily voted for her because I feel like she's very qualified and so forth. It just wasn't my choice for a, a lot of nuanced reasons. Uh, the reality is, though, Wait, I, Aleem, you have nuance. <laughs> but, but the reality, yeah, well, the, the reality is, is that what stood out to me and what stood out to me about Joe Biden ever since I was old enough to know what politics were was that this, the man has character. He has an experience, a life experience that, that makes him see things in a way that I, that I, I, I embrace. I, 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 feel, I feel as though he cares about people for a reason, right? He has reason to, right? He cares about, about people's livelihoods. He cares about families, all for reasons. It's not just, just because, right? The, mm -hmm. the man has been through things that has built his character, right? And, 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 and with age comes wisdom as well. So when you add, add on top of that, that makes your decision making so much well, so much more well, uh, I, I don't, I, I'm, I'm lost, losing words here, but, but it makes your decision making so much more thorough. It makes it so much more rooted, right? And that's what I think character brings to a position like this or any leadership position is just understanding that when you're leading a large group of people, i.e. I, the United States of America, that you have to you have to believe in people. You have to you have to think the best of people. You have to see the best in people. You have to want the best for people. And if you don't have an experience that gives you that a reason to do that, it's going to be hard for you to lead those people. And so I think, you know, Trump and Vance, you know, they're far, and far away from that, as you can possibly imagine uh, from that experience. But, you know, people like Joe Biden, people like Kamala Harris, people, uh, people like Barack Obama, people, people like, you know, uh, uh, the, the vice presidential candidate. Um, the, um, all these people have experiences that give them this character. So that's that's my opinion. So why is it important for a president to have character? Why is it important for a president to not flip flop? Decision making, right? It, you 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 ha well, flip flopping is you know that's a, a negative term, but I don't have a problem changing with person changing positions, but as long as it's for the right reasons, right? When you f come to find a reason that. The, the way you were thinking before was wrong or, or, or wrong headed, then change. There's no, nothing wrong with that. But if, but character gives you that foundation of doing it for the right reason. That's why it's important. Well, and, so and you're to build describing off of that, evolving then. too. Go right. ahead. That, yeah, go that, ahead. That, that's, that's evolving. Right. Yeah. But I would say to, to kind of build on Aleem's point, that is the literal opposite of what JD Vance has done. Right. <laughs> on, on the one hand, you can evolve when you live through a new experience or you're exposed to new information that then informs your way of thinking. And then you change your conclusions, your viewpoint based upon new information, new experiences. JD Vance didn't have any new information or new experiences. He just, you know, licked his finger and stuck it up in the wind and saw which way the wind was blowing. He <laughs> knew that his, you know, he, he got his, he got from ground level to national prominence by being the anti-Trump, right? Mm -hmm. And he got his book deal that got parlayed into, uh, made for a, a Netflix movie based off the book, right? Um, got elected to office by fighting with Trump in the media over, you know, the things he had said, calling him a Nazi, calling him the America's Hitler, um, 
and and getting elected for, to the Senate from from Ohio. And then now he knows that, well, Trumpism is here to stay. He's ridden that bandwagon in this weird way where on, on the one hand, he's on the outside looking in, but he claims to be from that world and returning to it after his time in his career, whatever. It's all fake, of course. Hmm. But he, he got from A to B by being the anti. He knows to, go, to get to the next step from there, to go up to the next level and get real hard power. That meant aligning himself with Trump and pretending that he somehow saw the light, right? So that's the complete opposite. He's pretending that he somehow had this evolution and came around to Trump's way of thinking. We can see from everything he's said and done since joining the ticket that that's complete crap, but mm. he's doing it for power. And mm. that's that's really what the Trump movement's all about for those guys, is that it's about raw power. Because any of the people who who have at previous times, like in 2016, stood up, however, temporarily to Trump, they all got in line. Ted hmm. Cruz comes to mind again. I know I'm re repeating myself. Yeah. The people who actually like stuck with their guns and said like, this is wrong. I'm not going, I'm not standing by this guy. They're not in office anymore. They've lost political power. Yeah. Yeah. All right. So here just really quick, yes or no uh, answer. And then we'll move on to our next topic. If, if Donald Trump loses this election, mm -hmm. is MAGA purged from the party? No. And Trump isn't purged from the party? No. Christian? No. Aleem? I, I don't see it happening in the near term. I feel like it, 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 it's a matter of time because if if Kamala has the success that I foresee her having, uh, because we're poised to really do well as a country these next four years, which is which is also the reason I'm so scared about what well, was was so terrified of, of Trump becoming president, because if he by happenstance just didn't do anything and actually allowed the country to do well, which which is which is a long shot. But if he, if that happened, it would have looked like he had something to do with it. And that would have been terrifying because that's when it becomes a problem. So I feel like, you know, we're, we're headed in a good direction. And, and you know, you know if, if people see what success she has, then they're going to have to move away from MAGA and understanding how ridiculous that is, that whole concept was. That was more than a yes or no answer. <laughs> well, you know, nuance, nuance. What do you want? From? Nuance. All right. So let me, let me go on to the next one. This is the final piece on the state of the race. What does Kamala need to do? What issues does Kamala need to be out in front of to not only lead for success at the ballot, but in her first year's presidency? What are some things that she needs to do right now? Christian, give her some counsel on issues, an issue or issues she needs to be out in front of. I See, I don't think you, you even need to be out in front of the issues right now. I think that that's, that's a losing proposition. I think that was one of the main things that got, aside from cognitive whatever aside from shuffling to the podium aside from having a, a weakened aged voice that was the single most harmful thing to joe biden's debate performance is he came to a street fight with a you know 97 bullet point policy proposal that's that's <laughs> not going to work and you saw you saw him short circuiting as he tried to remember okay where does this fit into this conversation no it doesn't work right this is not the kind of fight that we're in this is and and people have been trying to like bring this up in you know on roundtable discussions and podcasts and something like it's a hot take or something that it's all about the feels and not about the substance. Well, yeah, I'm sorry. Like this is the you know the the era of TikTok elections and Donald Trump and JD Vance and this kind of ridiculousness. Like you know, if if Kamala Harris wants to lose, then go ahead and dig in on the finer policy points. That being said, she alludes to certain issues that I think hit people on a visceral level, whether you're talking about things like the fact that so many Americans, regardless of where they live or what line of work they're in, feel as though all they're doing is grinding themselves to death, just working to pay bills and never getting ahead like their parents and grandparents were able to do. She mentions those sort of things, being able to not just get by, but get ahead. So economic issues. Uh, I think she's been very clear about where she stands on immigration, which is something that Biden could not get his arms around in the same way. And it would still always benefit Trump in the polling whenever he brought up immigration. Right. And that was a big problem in that same debate as well. So economics and immigration. Um, but a again, like I, I don't think going too deep into any of these issues is a great idea talking about the feelings, talking about like getting that positivity back into American politics, flipping it where she is the Reagan, it's morning in America candidate, while Donald Trump is the Dow where everything is terrible candidate like that. She's got to keep that going. Don't forget here. We don't have another year of this, right? We're down to about what it's time of recording 86 days, 87 mm -hmm. days left, right? Like that. This is what it is. Mm -hmm. uh, she's got to stick with that. 
Aleem, we talked on this pod quite a bit about the conflict and the war and or the annihilation of people in Gaza. Does Kamala Harris need to take a position on the the Israeli government versus the people of Gaza? So, so that, that's that's I'm glad you asked that question because that's that's sort of I agree with Christian, but that's sort of where I depart in that I feel like there are some 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 issues like this one where she does need to stake something out at least in some framework, right? So I feel like the position she needs to take on Gaza is not who's bad and who's good, who's right and who's wrong. It's so much. It's 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 more so uh, a compassionate voice in this, recognizing the plight of these people that are being. Uh, bombed to death, literally, and the, also the the challenges that Israel has with respect to protecting itself from terrorism. I, I, it, they, the the conversation she needs to engage in that conversation to some extent, right? And not not saying I have the answer and here's what it is, because frankly, I'm not sure that that she does have the answer, and I'm not sure that any of us have the answer uh, right now uh, that that'll serve everyone uh, a, a appropriately or adequately. But she needs to say something. Uh, to at least rec show that she recognizes and has compassion towards the suffering that's going on. Now, that the the human piece, which is I think on this podcast something that we're that is really important to us, right? Because this is more than just winning election. Elections are representative of the will of the people. The will of the people in Michigan, with that said, is really important. Joe Biden had taken a significant decline, and there was a lot of people, as we discussed before, that may have been leaners and or just are deeply frustrated and or just alienated by Joe Biden because of his position uh, on Israel specifically. Mm -hmm. A composite of about 11 of 11 polls, national polls right now has Harris with a slight lead over Trump in Michigan, critical battleground state to state that she needs to win. Christian, do you think that she needs to take a position on the conflict? I mean, I think that I I would mostly agree with Aleem. She needs to it's not. It's not that she needs to come down on one side versus the other, or that she needs to uh, articulate a a conclusion to or that the, or a vision for a conclusion to the conflict. Um, but articulate that compassion. I mean, look, when she had um, the speech this past week or weekend, where you did have protesters screaming about about Gaza in the background. I mean. She was pretty clear, like, OK, I've heard you, but like, do you if you want Donald Trump to win, then like, just come out and say that. Exactly. I, I mean, like, this is this is the brutally honest truth um, that. <laughs> and I know that nobody wants to hear this. Right. But with any of these issues, this one in particular, but any sensitive issue. If you want to be able to even have the conversation once the election is over and everyone's gone home, you need to vote for someone who's going to actually listen in the first place. Yeah. Having a protest or digging your heels in and saying you're going to take the moral high ground by not voting, by voting in a, for a protest candidate, by whatever else it is, um, one, you're, you're doing nothing, just to be clear, that, that will help nobody whatsoever. Um, and two, you make it much more, all that more likely that someone will return to office who has been explicitly clear that they want dictatorial powers and they have no interest in the will of the people. And at that point, the entire conversation was just academic, right? It was performative. You made your point, And now you can do nothing to help anybody in the real world post November 5th. So yeah, yeah. that that's the long and the short of it. I mean, this is, I I do not by any means intend to belittle anyone's heartfelt concerns about the humanitarian crisis going on right now. And we've talked about this in the pod, I don't know how many times now since last fall, we're all on the record about where we stand on these things and how we all feel about it. But I'm talking purely nuts and bolts about politics right now. Um, this is the real world. And we have to be able to elect someone who will listen after they're already in office. So again, the Siena, the New York Times Siena poll has right now Harris at fifty percent to Donald Trump forty percent, forty six percent in Michigan. So again, going back to some of these data points, it looks like she's trending in the right direction. Mm -hmm. It may be that she needs to maybe suggest and signal a position, but not make a clearly articulated position because right now it right. seems right. that she needs to to make sure 
I think the one thing she can't do is give unabashed support of Israel. No. Oh, right, right, and right, I th- right. Yeah. And I think that that will present itself at some point, and she needs to be prepared for that. In my opinion, is that she should she should show empathy to the people that are here, that are suffering because of the decisions that we've made, and or for what and and maybe for what the Israeli government is doing, without necessarily taking an official position from the perspective of the United States of America, because she still is sitting vice president. So she has a clearly articulated position, which is in support of the current president of the United States of America, Joe Biden. All right. Speaking of Kamala, let's just take a couple of minutes to talk about the joy. And Christian, you started to talk about this. So I'm going to let you take the lead. What is the joy of Kamala and what is the grievance of Trump? I mean, how do you summarize that? I think we can make the inference, but how can you summarize that? And why is that important right now? I mean, it's usually important because what, what, Kamala Harris is doing right now is she's running against someone and a movement that is really dark and depraved and disgusting, right? Um, how do you really feel? <laughs> <laughs> well, I mean, it, let, let's step away from how I feel and just go through the facts, right? Someone who has been uh, convicted on 34 counts of fraud, that's dishonest behavior. Uh, someone who has been found liable for sexual assault, so tantamount to rape, but in a civil as opposed to a criminal court. So that's sexual abuse right there. Uh, someone that would who, be the disgusting. <laughs> and there's more. I, oh, there's I, more. I, I, I don't. I like how you keep jumping in as though, I, as, though, as though I'm anywhere near done with this list. Right. This is mm-hmm. this is like we right now. I've only gone back about like six months. We can go back about forty five to fifty years with this guy. Exactly. Um, you know, all the way back to the 1970s, and he and his father. Uh, being hit with a civil rights lawsuit by the federal government for denying apartments to black people, right? Uh, so she's she's fighting against that sort of ugliness, that sort of misogyny, hatred, racism, and she's not she's doing something that I think everyone would like to be able to do in moments in life, or even in big political collective moments like this, which is be able to be in the fight but not let that ugliness get inside you, right? She's she's leading that fight, but it's not consuming her. So she's being that happy warrior, which really nobody has been for a while. Uh, Joe Biden was uh, the the compassionate elderly statesman. He was also sort of that bridge candidate last, last go around where he was kind of that older white collar, uh, sorry, older blue collar white sort of um, Kennedy Democrat, right, after Trump. Um, but who's been the happy warrior? Who's been the forward-thinking person, forward-looking person? It's it's Kamala Harris right now, and people are clearly responding to that. And other people who are in positions of influence, whether they be on social media or pop stars, any kind of any any sort of celebrity, they're taking that and amplifying it, getting that to their audiences who may or may not all be registered to vote, um, who may or may not be politically involved. And so that's become contagious, but in a good way, right? That's something that's good. That positivity has been catching on. On the flip side, you've got Donald Trump who, like, look, I have I feel like I've had this different versions of this conversation since I was in, like, middle school civics class, right? Every time this country has any kind of step forward, there is the inevitable white backlash, right? Um, and every single time, though, that that backlash happens, it gets more ugly and more virulent. And we are now at the worst of them all, which is Donald Trump and and his crew, right? Mm -hmm. These guys are not even trying to hide the quiet part. They're saying it out loud. They've thrown away the dog whistles. They're just using the bullhorns right now, right? This is overt racism, overt misogyny. Uh, This is the guy who packed the Supreme Court to overturn Roe v. Wade, right? This is not like the problem is when you try to actually talk about Donald Trump and his following just merely citing the facts, even if I were just completely emotionless right now, and just like you said before, you were like, oh, tell us how you really feel. Like, well, I'm being emphatic in my expression, but all I'm doing is listing the facts, like exactly. listing out exactly. the actual um, you know, findings from the court of law. It's hard to actually talk about this guy and his people without sounding like you're being fanatical, without sounding like you're being the one who's being hyperbolic, right? But in fact, he and they are, are truly uh just that that awful and so it's it's a um clear dichotomy it's a clear split between the two sides that joy versus that grievance uh to Aleem's earlier point it's a little bit alarming 
that there is not already a much wider gulf in the numbers. <laughs> but um, like you said, John, there there tends to be a bit of a lag. Uh, and I'd like to see that that margin widen uh, in the next couple of weeks. All right. So I'm going to I'm going to take that and pull on that thread a bit and give it to you, Aleem. This is a multi part question. Is it time for joy again in our politics? I can remember a time when I mean, it seems like it was a while ago, but there was some excitement and joy in who the next president was going to be. And as a second part to that question, can joy purge out the MAGA movement without glossing over some of the legitimate concerns that Donald Trump supporters at one point had? You can make the argument now that to Christians framing that, you know, this is joy versus grievance, right? Some of those grievances with that said, you know, are legitimate. The middle class is getting squeezed. Mm -hmm. Forget it if you are not even in the middle class, like you were just getting all out crushed, right? Those things are legitimate. Okay. We went through this in 2007, in the 2007 election with uh, Barack Obama, and obviously, or 2000, 2008, rather, um, when hope was a slogan and hope was mm -hmm. this catalyst to drive so much. Mm -hmm. The problem with Barack Obama when he came into office is that where that was such a powerful political tool to get him elected, it became a double-edged sword once he was elected. So the question is, can Joy purge the MAGA, the MAGA movement without diminishing the grievance, the legitimate grievances that so many of his supporters have? So I, 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 very good question. And I'll, I'll, I'll start my answer to this question with, with, with a, uh, another question is that can joy exist in a pool of cynicism, right? That's, that's where we re really where we are right now, is that everyone in this country, one side or the other, is extraordinarily cynical. That is something that has grown over the last, I'd say, 12 years or so. Um, I think, you, and you touched on uh, the, the hope and the exuberance uh, upon uh, President Obama's first election, right? And then the, the fact that he didn't immediately tur turn everybody's lives into to wonderfulness um, that, that <laughs> in, influenced the cynicism. Oh, well, Obama didn't do nothing for us. You know, oh, my gosh. You know, it's like it, 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 it like like a, a president is 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 a, a king or some magician that can just make things better. This is what we, we at that point in 2008, 2009, we, I think, started to believe that the president could do these things that he really could cannot do and and not and and in fairness to president obama he didn't say he was going to magically change everyone's life he just wanted to push this message of hope and everybody said you know uh we believe in that message of hope and that means you better get it done you know and then the, the, <laughs> everything didn't change now frankly he did a lot and you know, we were we were in despair yep. as a country in 2008 as if you recall and he did a whole lot but it wasn't enough for a lot of people and 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 then then the people who just hated him, they were already on their on their uh, ship to to cynical land, right right there, right because they they're cynical like, island. <laughs> there you go. So it's like so now you have literally probably sixty percent to seventy five percent of this country just cynical about everything, right? Mm -hmm. So so and they're on opposite sides. So you cannot please either of them. Uh, so the reality is that we're in we're living that reality right now. So when you ask about joy. There's going to be 40 to, you know, 30 to 40 percent of us who can experience that joy. Um, but that's not enough to push out, you know, all, all the bad. Right. That it, there has to be something very specific that brings people to a, a, a sober realism and then says, OK, here's what is real and here's what we can do about it. It's not going to be perfect. And you got to be OK with that, you know. <laughs> It's going to change. Right. This is this is a country. It's not a, a, a car that you can turn around. It's a country of people who don't like each other. <laughs> and some do and some don't. So to fix all of your problems, and frankly, you're never going to fix everyone's problem, but to fix the masses problem, to make everything fair and to give us hope again, you have to be patient. You have to be cooperative. You have to be engaged. And all those things have to happen. Now, I don't know. What can do that, frankly? I mean, I, I, you know, I'm sure you, we sit here long enough, the three of us, we can solve the world's problems. But the reality is, is that I can't do it in this, in this answer. But the bottom line is that it ha that's the only thing that'll give us true joy. That's the only thing that's going to push out 
the the negative that's gonna that's gonna fill the fill the space and I guess push us in a direction where we we can all hold hands so to speak and 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 help get true progress lasting progress. So let me ask you this, and this can be for both of you, and then we have to move on. That is a big task to ask, mm-hmm. right? Like this is. Uh, as as far back as there have been civil societies figuring out why things like joy are important in the body politic, right? And I think that you have to be very careful um, because people will use realism as a as a segue for cynicism because it's just a little right. convenient. Sure, That's sure. a little easier. Yeah. And joy and and fostering joy it requires effort and energy. Like it's mm-hmm. not something that just is just floating around magically in existence. Gentlemen, how how can we, in a meaningful way, inject joy into our body politic? Mm. Now, this is something we can all, we can we can think about too. Like this is where I really test the sum of your educational experiences and your intellect, <laughs> right? And and guys, we've no had test. discussions <laughs> like this before. No, I, I'm serious. I mean, this is this is where it gets down to me. This is where the pod is fun. Mm. Yeah. How do we do it? How do we, even if it's just a little bit, how do we, how do we add joy into the body politic? That's tough, John. That, that's, I mean, I can tell you how, what makes and me actually, happy. no, I, I was going to tell you, it, it's actually a lot easier than you might think. Go for it. So I, this, I mean, it, you can't just do it with, with any old campaign or with, with any activity, right? Like it does, there is a lot to be said for having somebody at the top of the ticket who's going to bring the personality that brings in other people, volunteers, donors, whatever. Right. But if you're going to be part of that, um, because you, you've got someone you can believe in or a cause you can believe in really all it takes to go from anxiety and despair to that sort of joy is getting off your ass. I, I know that sounds kind of glib, but like, hear me out here. I have been, I am not a joyful person by disposition. <laughs> my my fourth grade teacher used to call me Eeyore. Um, <laughs> totally inappropriate in hindsight, considering how young I was. But, you know, maybe I could have used the hug instead of name calling. But anyway. Um, we'll talk about name calling we'll next. Talk about that next. Yeah. Um, but point being, like, it, it sounds... I, I, <laughs> Don't take it from me as somebody who is by default joyful and I say, oh, it's no big deal to get happy. I think it is a big deal. I struggle to be a happy person all the time. My point is, when you are sitting and watching TV and seeing the news all the time and feeling as though it is happening to you, that is where you can get depressed because you feel a lack of sense of control and also feel anxiety from that same lack of sense of control. Hmm. Now, if you if you volunteer, even if you don't like do it every single weekend, you're busy, you've got other things going on, but you volunteer a little bit, you get involved, you do something, you take baby steps, right? Let's say it's a, let's say it's anxiety inducing, or it sounds like a bunch of drudgery, a bunch of extra work to knock on doors or pick up the phone or go and do something or be part of a, um, you know, like I did the white dudes for Harris zoom call, um, the other week and we raised, what was it? $4.3 million in two hours over a zoom call. Um, just doing something then begets more action. And the more action you take, even if you don't throw yourself into it all on day one, but you, you know, do the door knocking, you make the calls, you get involved, you help, you, you help out and you do things. Um, yes, on, on the one hand, it's kind of a paradox, right? You have to, um, put out some energy, right? But on the other hand, what you're getting back is that joy because right then, The news isn't happening to you. You're making the news, right? You see reporters go out into the field into swing states and talk to people who are doing things. You can be one of those people that they're reporting on who's knocking on doors in Pennsylvania, New Hampshire, Wisconsin, whatever, right? Um, You say you can't travel. You can be making the phone calls. Whatever you want to do, uh, the easiest way to get a little bit of that joy is to be part of it in the first place and to not let the news happen to you. That's where the anxiety and depression creep in, I promise you. So it, it it sounds a lot, Christian, like you're talking specifically about joy in the election process. Yeah, well, that's that's where it is, though, because like you're asking about like joy in our politics, right? Like, like I said before, like yes, you have to have a Barack Obama, a Kamala Harris, somebody who's going to like light that spark. But that fire is not going to keep on burning by itself from just one spark. It takes 
everybody else contributing to it and making it grow, right? That's what I'm saying is that for you to be part of that, that's your way to get to that joy and away from the depression and anxiety that politics can cause when you're not active, when you're feeling as though it's happening to you. Aline, what is your take? Well, I, I mean, I, I, I was listening to Christian. I was, I was trying to, to get into the, the spirit of what he was saying. I was like, and I, I, see, I see that working. I, I understand that. But the problem is, is that that only works for the people who are, who are winning, right? If, 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 you're, if you're following the winner and you're involved in that, then, yeah, you're going you're gonna to experience that the, in, 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 in their success. You're going you're gonna to share in their success. But if you're, I, I've shared in some losses too. Well, I'm not. It wasn't. Oh, it wasn't all. You know, Obama. Oh eight. <laughs> yeah. But, I mean, but so so. But that, that's to say. So when you're when you're when you're working hard to try to get the person beaten, like mm-hmm. like the the right is in this case, and then they fail. Then then here comes another Tea Party. Here comes another MAGA. You know. So it's it's like we're back in the same boat. I, I'm so when John asked the question for me, I'm thinking more of a of a unifying um focal point right something like an olympics right you know everybody can get behind our athletes being successful on the world stage right to me you know you know and and to to be you know talked in the past since i mean you know the you know 9 11 was something that was unifying it was a sad tragic day but it was a unifying event right um you know things like that that bring people together, that people that people look past. Now, you can't have a leader like a Trump in place when those things happen because he's naturally, inherently, in every fiber of his being, he's divisive, right? That mm-hmm. so so you can't you need to have a person like a Barack Obama, and hopefully like a like a Kamala Harris or Joe Biden, who can be in place, and even a George H. W. Bush, frankly, you know, who can say, you know what, let's set everything aside here and let's work together, let's be together, let's share in this in who we are as as a country as a nation and 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 let's have some joy now obviously you don't want a tragic event to happen but the reality is you can have something take place or you can make something take place you can you can have an event or something that brings people together on a level that ex, that that transcends politics that's the only thing i can imagine that might do that something that transcends the political sphere you know, Aleem, that's a very good point, and it's a good segue to talk about the Olympics. But I do recall growing up, the Olympics was a time when the focus was solely on pride of the country. Mm-hmm. Didn't matter your political persuasion, from my perspective as a child. It didn't matter your political persuasion. It was, generally speaking, a unifying pride of this country. I even felt a little bit of that watching the Olympics mm-hmm. this year. Like, it didn't feel divisive. It didn't feel like I was an issue. You know, watching you pick your sport, you know, like yeah. the, the it's also the beauty of sport. But I agree with you. The point is that injecting joy into the Bali politic, maybe that first step is finding the things that truly unify us. Of course, there are, you're not going to get complete consensus. That just doesn't work. But what are the things that unify us and searching for those? Getting back to where well, we can disagree over the path, but as Barack Obama said, at least we're not disagreeing over the facts, <laughs> right? Like, how do we get back to that place? And I think, you know, joy, you know, it seems like it's a simple concept to your point, Christian. And I do think there's an action, like, it's just not going to magically happen. To use your yeah. phrase, Christian, I agree with you. You do need to get off your ass. <laughs> yeah. You know, like joy is the product of virtuous acts. Yes. In my yeah. opinion. Yeah. Right. So you, you need to do that. But it also helps when we can agree on a few unifying things, which I think we can. All right, gentlemen, speaking of the Olympics, I want to get through a a few points and then a few points and then there is a very good discussion we're going to have about being fathers. All right. The the first the first uh, actually, we're going to we're going to speed through one topic. We're going to go straight to breakdancing. Okay, (laughs) gentlemen. All right, gentlemen. I don't know. And to our to our listeners, I don't know if you know this, but breakdancing was a sport in this year's Olympics. Yes, it was. Notwithstanding my own personal feelings of cultural appropriation, Aleem, should breaking have been an Olympic sport? Why or why not? Unequivocally, no. No, not at all. <laughs> I, I feel as though, and frankly, I don't even know how they, people qualify to get into it, so I don't know the whole process, but listening to the commentators, apparently they're doing various competitions that around the world that got the people mm-hmm. into this, so like, obviously they, they're ahead of us. 
they've been doing this already. But the reality is, is that as I watched that competition, even if it was done outstandingly, right? Let's just say everybody was great. To me, it becomes a bit monotonous, right? It's like there's only a certain number of of manu- moves you can do uh, that in, in that are char- characterized as breaking. You can be creative and you can do a little dance, but they're still judging you on your execution of flares and and spins and all these different technical aspects of of the sport. But it's not like a gymnastics event where you have these spectacular moves that that they're very specific in how the precision has to be, you know, uh, executed and all this kind of thing. No, with with breaking, it's like, all right, well, it's, it's artistic, it's art, it's artistry. So what is appealing to my eye is not going to be appealing to someone else's eye. I, I've seen people break dance. I saw competitors in that competition. I was like, oh, but what she did was, I, I didn't watch the men. I didn't get the, the chance. I didn't make it to the men. So I, I only saw the women dance. And I was like, oh, well, well I like what she did better than what the other person did. But yet the person I thought did really well got different votes. And there's no explanation as to why <laughs> she got fewer votes. So it's like, it's hard in art to to have a competition. It's almost like saying, who wrote the best song? Like, you know, whose poem was the best? Like, you know, that's all. Who... Kendrick Lamar's. <laughs> yes, yeah, obviously Kendrick, you know, technically this was better. No, I mean, so so to me, it's 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 too hard to judge one and two. It's very unclear as to the qualifying pr- uh, uh, process. Uh, and I'm sure everybody's seen uh, <laughs> what I'm talking about with the young lady from Australia um, uh, doing her performance that was pretty pretty comical by most people's approximation. Um, but she- to our <laughs> listeners, if you haven't, if you haven't, go to the internet and just search Australian breakdancer. Ray, Ray Gun. <laughs> Ray Gun is her name. Oh my goodness. And uh, like, look, you will probably have a similar reaction to us, <laughs> Christian. As a lifelong yeah. break dancer, no, do you have totally. any thoughts? <laughs> no, no. Actually, thoughts? my my only input to this discussion is the only thing that I I caught about um, Olympic break dancing was, um, and this is very on brand for me, the NPR report on the politics of the language around break dancing in France, where um, there was a debate about how different things, how the sport should be described, how, what, what, what terminology should be used, um, because it is an American import and they were deciding to what extent they should be using French neologisms to describe different moves or just use French accented American terminology. That's about all I caught. That, that's um, pretty interesting in and of itself. Like, there's yeah. a lot of, there's a lot of, do things. you want to expand on that? No, well, I just I was on the, the I was I was caught in traffic and that came on the well, radio. That was pretty much no, but, I mean. but the the broader part of what you, what you said is how do you even deal with this? And, and there's been some articles and conversations that I've seen on this with respect to this being so inherently disrespectful to uh, you know African American culture in how it was executed. Now I I'm I'm not I'm not a dancer. I I can't really weigh in on mm. this. You know, much like Christians imply, it's like I'm not really close to the art. You know, I've I've yeah. watched it since I mean, we were, we're children of the 80s. So we've watched this stuff for many, many years. But that's not to say we don't do it. Right. Um, right. But, you know, there, so so is it something that's been co-opted here and is just, you know, being put on display? It's like, you know, you know, you know we've, we've internationalized it without any kind of consent. I don't, I don't know. Or, or buy in. I, I, I don't know how it, I don't know how it works or how it should work. I, I, watched, I mean, I don't know. I don't know wife. if you've 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 spent any time in France, but any Black American art form, from jazz to yeah. rock to hip hop to, true. I mean, it's all gone international yes. for yes. many decades yeah. now. That's and that, they that, cat, homage, that right? cat has been out of the bag for some yeah. time. And and the French yeah. generally have paid homage to African American. Oh, I saw what you did there. <laughs> I saw what you did there. Yeah, yeah. yeah to, uh, good one. I mean, so so uh, so you know, I, I I and that's not so. I'm not knocking. You know, you know, you know, Europe was doing was doing better by us than America was for a long time with respect to art. Mm-hmm. So I, I, you know, I'm not I'm not downing that. It's just the question has to be answered. Is that there were no? I don't believe there were hardly any black judges. There were there were no black competitors. There were no, no there were no black DJs. There were no black announcers. So it's like you know, it's like yeah. eh. well, to your <laughs> point though, Liam earlier. It's it's kind of an odd thing because I, I don't have a strong opinion one way or the other about whether or not it should be in the Olympics. Uh, but yeah, I mean, I 
it is odd because I would consider it an art form. I mean, one that requires physical exertion, of course, but and skill. Yeah, no, no, no. I, of course, but I mean, like, if you had to break it into like, is it in the same category as? roughly speaking, as painting versus sprinting. Like I, you know what I mean? Like I, I struggle to see. But anyway, I, it's. So I'm, I'm going to put a cap on this. I think I could make the argument that breaking should be and could be an Olympic sport, but it needs the robust infrastructure that other sports Agreed. have. It's unclear how uh, people rise on a country by country basis. Of course, they're international competitions, but on a country by country basis, mm-hmm. how do you determine who are the best four or five breakers from your country? That's where it's challenging. I think it. I think it is maybe an attempt to be more inclusive with the sports in the Olympics, but I think it falls flat because it's not clear what infrastructure exists to allow breakers to enter into the Olympics. And I, as funny as watching the breaker from Australia was, I think it's also representative of this very idea that there isn't really a mechanism to bring people in. You just got some people that are really skilled. I mean, you can go on the internet right now and you can see breakers from France that are far more skilled than anyone in the Olympics or as skilled as the best. Yeah. So at any rate, gentlemen, I'm going to, I'm going to put our final topic on the table here and I will set the stage. So as we discussed, I had this past weekend, I had a conversation with my child, with my son, and he sent me a clip a screen grab really of a clip. And he said, basically dad, the Titanic had a hole in it. It didn't sink because it hit an iceberg and the picture itself, you know, it had some smoke. It looked like it was leaving the dock. And if you looked at the picture, it looks like, Oh, there was a massive hole. (laughs) And I explained to him, well, if there was, they wouldn't have let it leave the dock, let alone travel from the UK to America with a massive hole in the hull. And then I sent him just a a video explaining how it sank, why it sank. And if you are interested, you can go on the internet and you can see all the different explanations for what happened when it hit the iceberg and sank. My question to both of you, and I know that you both have thought about this answer because we've already talked about it. Um, how do you teach your kids how to identify misinformation? Or what advice can you give to our listeners for talking with your children about identifying misinformation and guiding them towards what is true, what's accurate? Because this is really a discovery. Aleem, I'll start with you. How do you, and like, look, I'm not asking you to be an expert. I'm asking you to talk about lived experience. Sure, right? Because this is something that we all deal with. No, no. How do you teach your kids to spot and deal with, your son rather, to, to spot and deal with information, misinformation? No, no, absolutely. Uh, well, one, it's for me, it, it really sum, sums up into creating a framework around him and his life that establishes a hierarchy of validation points, right? So I, I, whenever he wants to verify that, you know, something that information that he receives that he did not know is good or bad, he always knows to come to my wife or myself. Anything he learns, he should share it with us, whether it be in school, whether it be online or anywhere else. Share it with us. Mm-hmm. And, 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 and sometimes he'll have questions about, is that, is that true or not? And he can bring that, that consternation to us as well, and we'll help him work through it. So the bottom line is making sure that not only are the lines of communication between our son and us open, but they're, they're encouraged and they're almost required, making him understand that, that that's a requirement at this stage in his life to come to us for his information needs, right? So no Alexa, you know, we can ask Alexa anything he wants, but that doesn't mean he doesn't have to ask us too, you know, because we verify whether or not Alexa was giving him the right information. And that, so, and, and it just, you know, not to belabor the, the topic a little too much, but um, generative AI, you know, and we, we talked a little bit about this, is that generative AI, it, it looks for sources. It's not always right. We know that, right? But it, get, it presents things in such an authoritative manner that it can easily lead a child to believe that it's giving them all right answers all the time. So right. I don't I, I rejected the use of generative AI for our son at, at this point in his life because I, he doesn't know it it, it, it. it challenges that framework that I mentioned. It challenges that too much. Right. It makes it difficult for him. It makes it too easy. So it's like if we're not around immediately accessible or maybe upstairs or downstairs, he might ask it a question and be inclined to just move on that question. I don't want that to happen. Right. I want I want us to be, you know, available and, and encouraged to engage with us. So I'll I'll stop there, let Christian you know, address it. 
So you're, and just to summarize, I mean, it's about having a framework. Just as a follow-up question, do you allow him to use search tools independent of you? I mean, do you encourage him to, to research and be inquisitive independently? Or do you, are you a gatekeeper as to how he can pursue that, and information? That's a good question, because I used to. I actually, I'd, I'd say going back a couple of years, I did allow him to, if he, if he had a scholarly inquiry of some kind, I would let him use Google or something to look for it. But more recently, over the last year, we had to stop that. Gus <laughs> is like, no, it's returning. First of all, the first uh, five <clears throat> responses are sponsored responses anyway. So that's, yeah, right, that's the problem. Right. So, so the answer is no, not anymore. No. Not without. No, I mean, Google's not what it used to be. Now, I mean, and especially since the, since the AI crap came out, it's just, I mean, it used to be you'd go on Google and you would get a certain, you know, organic, mostly search results. Now it's like you said, the first five. Well, no, now the second five things are the advertisements. Above that, it's this generative AI garbly book where it's like, oh, we're going to like come up with an entire complete answer for you based off of our reading of these other outside web pages, then it's advertisements, then it's the search results somewhere down at the bottom. Exactly. It's completely not what it was even five years ago. Exactly. Yeah. So Christian, to you, how do you deal with helping your your son navigate misinformation? I mean, it's yeah. again, it's the world that we live in now. Mm -hmm. I mean, people use it as yeah. a political tool. People use it uh, for the purposes of selling things, it's just to get clicks, getting to clicks. Get ad revenue. Yeah. So right. I mean, I, how do you? I, yeah. Go ahead. I know. I talked to him about that. I I ask him. So I mean, that's actually usually like the last step, but um, because the way it started was he would on Saturday mornings watch things on YouTube and he would see these thumbnails and then come to me and say like, oh my god, like so and so found a megalodon shark that's still alive in the modern time and like all this stuff, right? So. That was step one, was looking for doctored photos. Mm -hmm. So I would say like, okay, well, look at the photo here. And you see all the other thumbnails too. Like, yes, they might be composite images with like people like we have for our, for our, this podcast, right? Our heads are like all put together in a thumbnail or whatever. Okay, well, you can tell that that's been edited, obviously. But this one here, okay, this has been edited. But can't you see that like maybe that shark is not actually a photograph? It looks like it's computer made. Right. So we'll talk about sort of the looking at the quality of the, the images that he's seeing, right? Picking apart what is real versus what has been doctored. Um, then I ask him um, just to kind of do a gut check about whether or not something seems to be realistic or something is so over the top that it's probably not realistic. Right. So like, OK, the largest ever great white spotted off of Cape Cod or South Africa or whatever. OK, that could be a real thing. Megalodon living in 2024. Do you think that's really real or wasn't there an entire movie about how they're extinct and they, you know. OK, so then that's probably not real. Right. Um, and then the last part is actually talking about motives like that, you know, saying, like, mm -hmm, OK, mm -hmm. well, so these things over here are maybe somebody who made a silly video that you want to watch because it's got your favorite characters in it. And they will have little disclaimers saying that they have sponsorships or whatever, and that's how they get their money from making the video. Over here, though, where this video pops up first, and they've got these crazy graphics, and they're making this claim about something that's probably not real, why would they be doing that? Well, it's because it's going to get you to click on them first as opposed to the real things, mm -hmm. and so that you'll then click on them and then they'll get more ad revenue. And we talk about sort of their motivations for doing something like that. That's dishonest because I think a lot of the times, I mean, my son is nine. The fact that somebody would be dishonest just to get the clicks, get the ad revenue wouldn't occur to him at first. So we have that conversation as well. That's, that's a really interesting point, Christian. And maybe this is where we leave it. It is really interesting and challenging to talk about motivations. Yeah and how people will lie and or mislead to get what they want. I mean, that's a tricky discussion to have with a kid with yeah. your children because, yeah. you know, they all you don't want them to develop that as a tool. Mm -hmm. Right? So the question is, you know, how can you this kind of goes back to what we were talking about with joy. You know, like what structure can you put in place where someone can grow into a concept or idea, in this case truth. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Cuz that's really what we're talking about what's true. Yeah. Right? Not necessarily what's, you know, reality and truth. You know, they are um, 
they can go side by side, but reality can easily be warped. Yeah. yeah. Right. This is what we're talking about. So really the path and the pursuit is truth. How do you build a framework where your, where your children, our sons in particular, know how to pursue what's true and what's not. And obviously, I mean, I've got a daughter too. So this, yes, this is, I'm not worried about her as much. <laughs> she is, she is strikingly brilliant. Yeah. Yeah. But I think this is why we do the, the podcast, right? Like I don't have the answer mm -hmm. to that. I think that we have all benefited from having spectacular educations, mm -hmm. not because we went to the fanciest schools, but because we saw um, truth. the way exactly in the, in the, in the tradition of the university. I mean, that's why it exists. So at any rate, gentlemen, this has been an absolute joy. To <laughs> that is like your you word you of the day. This is like Sesame Street. That's like your word of the day, man. By my model, hey, that, you can't I mean, have but, any joy, John. I'm too cynical with that. <laughs> well, like, look, I, I do believe, you know, and it's funny. I don't think joy and cynicism are the, the diametrically opposed. I think it really is hope and cynicism. Yeah, yeah, mm -hmm. yeah, right? yeah, yeah. You know, absolutely. like that. Those are those are the two absolutely um, kind of opposing yeah, you have opposing ideas, hope? but. It, why not? You, that, that, that would like be joy, a joy, joy can, <laughs> joy, joy can be the result of something. Yeah. Hope is the belief that something could happen. Right. So I, I think I, you can. This you can be have a whole other conversation because I have. I, I, I have it, some it, absolutely, it absolutely could, but it seems to me like you're going down a cynical <laughs> rabbit hole, and we don't have time for that. We're going to end on joy, <laughs> and you won't joy stop. Light. You won't stop. Joy and on a high note. <laughs> joy it is. <laughs> Listeners, uh, this has been Good Guys Getting Better. I'm John Borden. I'm Aline Boltwright once again. I'm, I'm Christian Hanley. Thank you so much for tuning in and listening, and we'll see you on the next pod. And John, don't forget, what's the call to action? Come on, you got to do it. Oh, I'm sorry. I'm new to this, everyone. <laughs> you gotta click. You've got to give us a thumbs up. You've got to subscribe, and you've got to share us with everyone on your social media networks, or you will have no joy. <laughs> That's a cynical statement. No. Right? <laughs> no, but thank you all for listening. All right.